So, so Marshall, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. I, w- I was really excited to um, to speak with you. I think when I, I watch a lot of video podcasts, and I don't want to be negative, but I find a lot of podcast guests are kind of inexperienced, uh, younger, very energetic and, and awesome and everything, but don't have that, you know, um, I don't want to make you sound too old, but you know, 20, 30 years of real life experience. And you are one of the, for me, you're one of the rare, and actually that's the kind of guests that I always like to have. Nothing against the young 20 something energetic uh, people, but I like to have guests that actually have decades of business experience or technology experience. We're actually in on a lot of things that were groundbreaking 20, 30 years ago. And for me, you're, and you're one of those people. So I'm really, really happy to, uh, to have you as a guest today. You're welcome. It's good to be here. Great. So <clears throat> when, I was going, uh, when I was going through your LinkedIn profile, which I hope you don't mind, we'll probably share your LinkedIn profile at the end of the, the video. Um, because I think that you have a lot to to give, and I, I think you also have that attitude and spirit of of giving, um, you know, mentoring um, type of person, um, which is great. Um, but when I was lo- looking through your LinkedIn, it, it's difficult to pinpoint, um, you know, what your most maybe groundbreaking moment or what your most important moment of your career was. So I don't know, maybe you can kind of introduce yourself. I don't know if you want to go through the entire, um, your entire pedigree, or if you want to maybe just hit on, hit on one or two career highlights, you know, because I, I see some stuff on, in your profile, like, you know, for example, the Motorola days, you were on the ground when they were inventing Texting, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So, <laughs> oh wait, what's that? This, this oh was yes, the, this was the first text messaging device with a keyboard that we re, that Motorola released in uh, in uh, 1997. So and, that's a perfect example. So you were actually on the ground with Motorola, if I'm not mistaken, when all that was happening. Right, I was one of the uh, the first uh, engineers uh, on that team uh, that Motorola started as a, sort of like an internal startup at the time, you know, because the I was in Atlanta and the major Motorola facilities were like in Chicago and Florida and Texas, and a, a couple rogue uh, executives of Motorola decided to start this group up because they believed that there was a market for handheld uh, communication devices, sort of like you know, a la Star Trek, you know, or something like that. And so they... So just, just to clarify, at that time, there was no, there was no texting technology. No, no, actually, the, uh, um, at the time, um, SMS was start, just maybe they were talking about using it, you know, the short messaging service on cell phones. Um, that required, of course, the, the, the advent of digital cell phones, which were just coming out in 97, 98-ish time frame. Um, up to that point, the, um, there was digital paging where you could send messages out to a pager. And then okay. there was text messaging. You could send text messages out to text pagers. Um, but Motorola wanted to send messages back the other way. And so they started with the first oh, products. Yeah. All they could do is say yes or no. Okay. Okay. So... What did a cell phone look like at that time? That, those, those were the ones, and, and, and I had them back then too. So those were the ones where basically you can just make outgoing calls with a little screen sometimes just with the, displaying the phone number um, type of thing. So, so the text messaging was happening, but it was through pagers, and it was just a one way you get your beep and you see the message, whether it's a number to call back or it was mostly numbers, and then in uh, 95 or so, they started sending text messages. Um, okay. And by 97 or 96, they had the ability to send somebody a question, and they could answer yes or no. Okay. And that was a, a, a little device called the Tango. And then the, 
but that allowed the device to actually communicate back. And so um, they started using that mainly to have guaranteed delivery. So the network would continue to send the messages until the device acknowledged that it received the messages, which was real important back then because usually you page somebody and you had to hope that it made it. You know, yeah. they now had the ability to acknowledge messages. And so once they had that ability to transmit back, um, the payload was very, very small, you know, a couple hundred, maybe a hundred bytes of characters. And so then we realized that, you know, we could create a product like this where you could actually start to initiate messages. And so in the summer of 97, we were actually, well, actually the fall of 96, we started sending messages back and forth um, on the SkyTel network. And it was at the time, it was really cool because, you know, it didn't matter where you were. I remember being on, I was, took a tour on an aircraft carrier and I was sending messages to my wife from the aircraft carrier, you know, near Norfolk. And it's just the coolest thing to be able to send her messages and she was writing back. And now, of course, we didn't have the ability to take pictures, but this is 10 years before the iPhone. Yeah. Years. And it was, it still was another three years before we had one of these devices with a camera in it. Uh, we had a camera module in 2000. Right. That's beautiful. So would you consider that era in, in your career to be your career highlight? Like what, in, what, what's, in your opinion, what's, what's that what's well, I guess career I, highlight? So go back, you know, to uh, 1981 or so. I was in college uh, going to school and I was writing software to, to put myself through school. So I was, writing business software. And then I got a job writing computer games when the IBM PC came out in August of 81. So winter of 82, I got approached by a guy. I said, hey, I want to create a Pac-Man clone for the IBM PC. So I worked with him and we developed um, a game called PC Man, which was the first uh, Pac-Man game for the IBM PC that was color. And we sold, you know, tens of thousands of copies of that program over a period of a year. And it was a really big deal at the time because almost every PC you bought in 82 and 83, they had a color monitor, had our game on it. But that was, that was sort of my introduction to commercial software. But then I, my, the thing that really got me, you know, my highlight in my career, I guess, would be a product called auto menu, which was a menuing system for DOS computers. And I came out with that in the summer of 83. And it's a, it's a piece of software. It's, it sounds silly to even talk about, but it was a piece of software that when you boot up the computer, it gives you a list of programs like WordPerfect, DBase, you know, um, Xtalk, whatever you wanted to run uh, on your computer. And back then, around 83, they came out with the first computers with hard drives that had 10, 10 megabyte hard drives. And you could actually put multiple programs on the same hard drive. Whereas before you use different floppies. And so oh, therefore okay. people had to know the DOS commands to go to between the different directories to run the programs and my menu made it easier for them. So if you were a corporate user, you would buy the three big programs, WordPerfect, DBase, and 123, and you would put auto menu to run those programs. And so I literally sold thousands of those. Now, what was interesting though was, you know, I was a college student. Yeah, I was going to say, because yeah, 81, you know, like, how am I going to market this thing? And a friend of mine told me about, well, hey, you know, um, why don't you put it up on a bulletin board and, uh, and ask people for money? And so I didn't do that. What I did is I put the first version up there. I said, I'm, I'm looking for a job. Hire me. Here's an example of my work. I even gave people the copy of the source code at the time. Wow. And, uh, and I, uh, about a week or two later, I got a letter from some guy who says, I'm sorry, I, I can't offer you a job, but here's a $20 check. And okay. I said, well, that's pretty good. So then I started, uh, so I changed what I've asked for. I asked for $20 and then I asked and I released it. And within weeks, I started getting $20 checks in the mail. Um, and then when I started with 83 until 1990, probably the peak just before Windows uh, 3 came out, I had 35 employees and I had made, you know, well over $5 million. And most of that money was people just sending me checks in the mail because what this was, I, the marketing method I was using was called, uh, would soon be called shareware. And at the time I called it user supported software and shareware didn't exist, but I was like me, Jim Button, Bob Wallace, 
um, where the big three share were authors, we were the first ones to make a million dollars by asking people to send us $30 checks. That is incredible. A million dollars, $30 at a time is, that's a lot. That's a lot, you know, and, and to have people send you the check, get out their checkbook, put it in an envelope, mail it, because there's no website to order off of, nothing like that. You couldn't go to the store. And so in 86, I went to my first computer show, Comdex in Vegas, and I had a booth. And I actually um, made a boxed version of the product to sell at the, at the local computer store. And I had multiple products, you know, AutoMenu, uh, TreeView, which is a file manager. I had Network HQ, which was the first uh, network management system. It was a tool to allow you to inventory all the computers on a network. And if you imagine, you know, put yourself in 1988, you just rolled out, you know, Novell Networks to Coca-Cola you know, to all the computers and put them all on the same network and you have problems, you know, how do you manage all that? And that my software was one of the first pieces of software that would actually tell you about every computer on your network and allow you to do an inventory. And so those were some of my products. And then, I, and then my last big product was something called Rosebud, which was, uh, I like to call it the one of the first electronic newspapers that you could have on your computer. It would actually, you would actually uh, tell it what you were interested in. It would co connect to the CompuServe information service and download stock information, news, weather, um, sports scores, and present it to you in some, uh, something that looked like electronic newspaper. What year was that? That was, uh, that was 1990, uh, 1995. If you do your history, remember what was going on around 84, 85, the internet was coming out. It wasn't a thing quite yet. People were still using bulletin boards and information services like CompuServe and the source and, and stuff like that. And uh, I was using Co CompuServe's information service to get all this information. And at the time, they let you do it for free, if you remember. And it, so, I, so my product was selling like crazy. I was selling like 500 copies a month. And then CompuServe changed to uh, change the pricing plan on all these information services that I was connected into, not free to cost money. And so then my, my product just ended almost the next day because people said, well, this sure, is gonna cost me way too much money to, to use. And then the internet happened. And, and, and so stuff like this was uh, no longer, you know, as advantageous as it was. So it's interesting that in your college days, you were pioneering and you were selling your ideas and, and just at a college level. So that's, that's impressive. It's also interesting that you would think you would continue that path of inventing and, you know, you had 35 employees. So what was next after having 35 employees? And then I think you kind of went into the corporate life, right? You started yeah, working so, with the big uh, corporations. So, you know, I'm, so 1990, I turned 30 years old. So, you know, I, as I call it the messy thirties, you know, I, I got married, started having kids, you know, and mortgage, mortgage and everything like that. So as, as a lot of people say, a lot of people stop wanting to be, want to be a little bit more risk averse. And I, you know, auto menu was a great product, but as soon as windows 3.1 came out in 1990, you know, people started using windows. And when windows 3.1 came out, in 90, 92, 93, it really changed the trajectory of that product. It started going down because DOS yeah, were history at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my last product, uh, the Network HQ, I actually sold that to Novell and Unisys. And, um, and I really, I, that was probably my first mistake is I sold my last product that was making money. <laughs> Yeah, I was so excited about selling it, you know, and I thought that I was going to make some more, a lot of money on Rosebud. Um, but Rosebud just wasn't going to last because of the whole internet thing. So mm -hmm. that was, so, so from that point on, I, my company, I, I let most of the people go. I had another business. I had a packaging business where we do software packaging and product packaging and shipping and everything. And I had 15 people working for that business. Um, Oh, nice. So I had that business going on, but I didn't want to do that. So I brought a partner in to run that business for me. And then I decided um, I would uh, uh, maybe do some consulting. And my first consulting job was to design the user interface for this product. And I, so I spent the summer of, uh, 80, of 96 during the Olympics in Atlanta, when I, that's where I lived, developing the UI for this. 
And when I got done, they, the guys at Motorola asked me if I would come on and, and uh, run the application development team to build the product. And that, you know, I'm 36 at that time. That's my first job ever working for somebody else. And that was quite the eye opener. I learned a lot. I wish I would have done the Motorola career first before I started my own company. I didn't know anything. Of, I didn't know the, about the concept of HR and human resources and, you know, and, you know, and how you pay people and stuff like that. You know, unfortunately, all my employees that work for me, they, we all had to learn. I still remember my office, the lady I hired as my office manager coming to me and says, you know, we, we should have health insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, what is that? You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it was so new at the time, people just weren't doing that yet. And, and so, it, you know, but working for a big company like Motorola, I learned a lot about marketing, you know, a lot about finances. And, and really, I started really learning about formal pr- uh, software development processes, um, you know, iterative development to allow you to build large projects. Because this product here, I mean, this was a huge product because it had, you know, we had electronics guys building the circuit boards. We had mechanical guys building their cases. And then, of course, we had the software guys, and we were doing the software. We had the software to talk to the hardware. We had software to talk to the communications network. We had mm-hmm. software to do the user interface. It was a very complex product. And I learned a lot about how to coordinate large teams. We had 100, uh, probably close to 200 people working on this product. How many were uh, under you? How many were you? Uh, I, had, I had the um, application development team. I had about 30. 30. Okay. Yeah. So that, well, that actually, that was not your first experience at managing a large team because you had 35 employees right out of right. college. Right. But yeah. of, of the 35 employees, only like uh, six of them were developers. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I had marketing people, tech support, wow. manufacturing, office. I mean, there's... Okay a lot of things to run a business and from motorola so so you're managing that team in motorola and then from from motorola you went to a company called welch allen which was a medical device manufacturer so in um in 2002 right after the dot-com bust motorola went from 185,000 employees down to 60 and just Oof. right off a cliff <sighs> And they were, they were shutting down every group that they didn't think had any future. And at the time, uh, we had a cell phone-based version of this in, in uh, 2001, but it just wasn't selling. We, I think we sold like 500,000 units. It just wasn't enough units at the time to justify you know, c- continued support of the company. At the time, you had, had to do like 5 million units a year to be a viable product in, inside Motorola. Oh, boy, we were far from that. Yeah. And so in 2001, we, you know, our executives at the time didn't think text messaging was really going to be a big deal. And, but if you would have fast forward to the years, executives didn't think that text messaging was going to be a big deal. Okay. But we're the one, 2001. Yeah. 2001. Two but years later, text messaging just. Poof. Yeah. I think it was a Blackberry that. that well, Blackberry, of- ba- Blackberry came out in uh, 98. And so they were right on our heels um, yeah. and came out with a, a text messaging or uh, keyboard based product. Uh, but yeah, Blackberry was, they basically won that market. They owned it. Yeah, they were huge. About 2000 until, uh, until about two years after the iPhone came out, you know, Blackberry was a big deal. Yeah. I had about five or six Blackberries over the, their life uh, span and I loved them. And I love that. Uh, I yeah, needed I, the buttons, I, I, right? We all, all this. I, <laughs> yeah, I had them too, but I mean, uh, until the day the uh, iPhone came out, and I still remember yeah. telling my boss, and I, I actually made a package of the phone and, and directions and everything and sh- to, to show all the execs at my company, because I told them this was a big deal. Yeah, and, you recognize it right away. Yeah, and even though we couldn't write apps for it, I, I said, this is going to be a big deal. We need to be, they're going to let us write apps for it. We need to be putting energy into it. Okay. Um, never quite got into it as much as I would want to. But, but I, in 2002, I, uh, Motorola um, shut down a group I was in. Um, a month later, um, a, f- a co-worker of mine in another division of Motorola got a job at Welch Allen, and um, she suggested that they hire me to run a software group. And at the time, they had two people in their software group. Okay. So I got to be there and get the job of growing a group of software developers 
uh, to help us build software, you know, uh, that goes into medical devices, you know. So at the time we weren't really doing electronic, you know, blood pressure and stuff like that. We were still doing, you know, pump up the thing and a little needle moves, you know, and that tells you what your blood pressure is. We were starting to build electronic versions of those. And so I was building so building the software that goes inside the products as well as the software that the, these products would communicate to. And so there's, I spent a lot of time over the 13 years I was there building infrastructures to allow the medical devices to talk to what would become the electronic medical record software that the that hospitals use to run everything and keep track of all the patient medical data, such as uh, Epic is a really big one, Cerner's another one, um, all scripts. And these were these big electronic medical record systems where they kept track of all the history of the patient. And I built software to feed information into those. And so when you started there, there was two people on the team and you said you were there for 13 years. And how many people were, were there when, when you left? We had close to 70 software engineers when I left. 70. And you, you stayed at the top? Yes. So you, you were leading the entire team? Okay, that's... Always See, that's the stuff that I'm interested in. Like, well, I'm interested in everything, but I mean, that's, that's something that's really, um, that's really interesting, leading a team of 70 developers. Wow. That's yeah, and, and it was, you know, we had, um, you know, we had them in two, we had in multiple occasions. We had people in, at one point, we had people in the, in the Netherlands. Um, we had people in Oregon um, and Singapore um, and uh, this town in uh, upstate New York called Skinny Atlas. And so- uh, what, year was, what year was that? Let's see. What, 2002 to 2015. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, that's uh, 2000, so I really, 2015, okay. So I really lived there through a whole change. I mean, the internet yeah. was, was, was still going, but not nearly as big a deal as it is today. There was no cloud-based infrastructure like a, AWS or Azure. Yeah. Um, you know, the yeah. windows was still going on. People were arguing when I started there, the big argument was, should we spend more time on Linux versus windows? Okay. And there was a lot of people that thought Linux was the way to go. And, and as it turned out, you know, eventually windows really was the only desktop and Linux was really just for servers. It turned out, but then, you know, I still remember wanting to get into much larger systems, but our management team was afraid of building uh, software that was that required lots of servers to maintain. They didn't like doing the on-prem kind of. Um, and and when was, was that the was that the so 2015? So was that the largest team of developers that that you ever managed in your career? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. So, it, you know, but it, you know, I was I was part of the injury management structure, so I was actually involved in. You know, we had over 200 engineers in the group, so I was. I was involved in, you know, lots of that, you know, so uh, had okay. a lot of influence over a lot of it. And how, so now you mentioned that you had, you had teams pretty much all over the world, it seemed. And yeah. how, you now obviously there's a massive difference between communicating with all those teams in 2002 versus 2015. But in, gen in general, without going through like the, the, the different phases, in general, I'm interested, how was, even let's say 2014, like how was it communicating, because we'll try to make it relevant to now, how was it communicating with all those different teams, time zones, languages? How did you well, manage it was, it was that? Pretty, it was pretty difficult. You know, we, um, you know, we got, eventually, I think we got really good at it. We, we realized that the, the, the teams at each of these locations had to be fairly independent. You know, um, we mm -hmm. spent a lot of time developing, um, you know, our source source code control infrastructure. I mean, we started off with, you know, IBM rational tools, you know, we use star team, lots of software configuration tools over the years. Um, we eventually uh, ended up using um, team systems, Microsoft team systems, which was, which was really good across it, when you have teams spread out over multiple locations, you got to have a tool that allows you to put all the software in one location. Now this is before get became yeah. popular. When I left, we were migrating a lot of our stuff to get because it was just easier and cheaper. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the days of people using team systems and everything, I think were going away because, you know, people were no longer wanting to maintain the on-prem 
infrastructure for all those tools they were wanting to migrate. So I was, we were in a, when I left, we were in a process of migrating everything to the cloud and closing all our on-prem stuff. Okay, nice. And what stood out to me in what you just said is keeping those teams independent. Right. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, so like, for example, let's say um, we're building a, a, a monitor. I, I would like to have the mechanical, electrical, and the software guys all be on the same site. Um, okay. So we would have small electrical teams, small mechanical teams, and small software teams all on the same site. And they would all be responsible for that product. It's very hard to when you start spreading um, the major engineering components across uh, time zones. So like, in other words, doing the software in New York and the hardware in Singapore, it doesn't work. Is if you're 12 hours out of sync, you know, and so you need that you need to have that collaboration of people coming together. Now, this was in an era where there was no zoom, you know, and there was no Microsoft teams. And, you know, we did not have that we had video conferencing, but it was super expensive you know it was a big built-in monstrosity in one conference room you know and you know and you sometimes you couldn't see what the other person was talking about and you know you maybe take the monitor and point at a whiteboard and you draw up some circuit diagram and you know you're trying to get that communicating across it was really difficult do you think that would be doable now with zoom or do you still have the same philosophy I i think zoom would uh well you know, right now during this pandemic, I mean, we're really exercising all these tools. I mean, uh, you know, people want to work at home anyways. A lot of times now you can't hire enough engineers in your local town anyway. So you're now hiring people all over the planet. Mm-hmm. So people are learning to work remotely and, and dispersed. You know, not the, the days where you could be next to each other are, I think, are, are becoming, you know, less common you know i think like for example my daughter works for a company she started in march she met her boss in a parking lot he handed her her laptop and she hasn't she hasn't been to the office once since and they're saying now it'll be next spring yeah you know and so it's you know and now she meets her co-workers on zoom mm-hmm you know, but and but they're actually very productive. They're getting, and some people were saying that their productivity is up over what it would be like if they were actually still coming into the office. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so because I think people are more focused and they're having less, you know, distractions and stuff like that. Now, it's not. I, I unfortunately, I don't think it's for everybody. I mean, it, I, I like talking to people. I want to be around and watch engineers working and and interact with them and and tell that I can tell if they're frustrated or, or they're stuck, you know, I want to be doing that kind of stuff. It's hard to do that remotely. Yeah. There's a lot of value to having, um, you know, to being in the same location and the collaboration and, you know, believe it or not, the water cooler talks, the, 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 the talks in the kitchen bring, I, I, it, I, I've seen countless occasions where just a casual conversation led to, an amazing fact-finding uh, journey, or even walking by someone's computer and seeing like what they're working on, and say, "Hey, are you stuck on that?" Because you know Johnny was stuck on that last week. It's yeah, it, it brings tremendous value. Yeah, and it can, and you can't underestimate that. Um, yeah. But uh, so, but working with, you know, so now we work with teams internationally all the time and it's become normal you know you everybody adjusts their schedule so that they can talk to each other and um yeah but yeah but getting teams to focus on certain you know have more control of their destiny allows them to work more independently and that's what was one of my strategies because if 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 the team over here was required to talk to this team to do anything then it slows everything down yeah, that's a great point because you can't have meetings with a with a you know some a team that's in Singapore. If you want to have two three meetings a week with them, forget it. It's just not going to happen. Well, you uh, can do it, a, but somebody's going to stay up to midnight. You know, like I used to do my calls with Singapore favorite. ten o'clock at night, and that 10 was o'clock at night, yeah. their time. Yeah. At three days a week, that was no big deal. But you know, my wife got kind of tired of me, you know, working at ten o'clock at night, and sometimes the calls would go to midnight. You know, and yeah. the day I was, uh, you know tired because I was up real late and but yeah. for the day if we have a brainstorm about hey we need to do this we had to wait until 10 o'clock at night to be able to tell them 
Yeah, that's that's one of the main obstacles with with working offshore is is that that pesky time zone uh, issue. Other than communication too, but I guess if you have someone on the ground, for example, in Singapore, that's maybe working in your time zone, kind of, and meeting with them once a week type of deal. I that's my was my strategy because a lot of times, you know, even though we both share the same language, you know, culturally there's lots of cultural differences, and so. Mm-hmm. If you're not careful, you you know it's hard to manage those folks sometimes because you don't understand the culture. Like you know, the, a lot of you know, it just there's lots of little nuances. Like they always are, you know, always nodding. You know, like yes, yes, I understand. And it's more of a nervous habit. It's not a yes, I understand. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I I still remember the first time at Mo- when I worked at Motorola. I had a team in India, and and I. Th- totally thought they understood what I was talking about and they did not understand. They just were afraid to say they didn't. That's, that's funny. That's the same type of experience that a lot of people have. I speak, I speak to people on a regular basis that tried to go the India route and, and just came back and said, I, I can't do it. I, I just can't take it anymore. And, and it's not, like you said, it's not a, it's not a slight to, to offshore, but a lot of times they don't understand um but like you said they're they're too afraid or they don't you know they want it to to seem seamless working with them and they end up providing what you do not want and 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 it's difficult but it did require you know a management team here that was willing to to figure out how to do the communications effectively because they they are extremely hard workers and very can be very economical but if you, there's just lots of caveats. I mean, you got to understand yeah. how to communicate with them. You have to understand that, you know, d- depend on your development partner, you know, you're not gonna necessarily going to get all A players, you know, yeah. you know, you, there's A, Bs and Cs. And so they, they're going to try to move everybody that they start, you start with, which are A players and then replace them with C players, you know, to save mm. themselves some more money. And you just have to learn how to know that that's going to happen to you and fight against it. Yeah. I always try to have two or three core people that never changed. Yeah. I know that I've, um, like I said, I speak to a lot of people that are in trouble in India and um, they're trying to, you know, get rescued by, by us. And, but the odd time I speak to someone that's actually getting things done in India and I tell them right away, I'm, I said, look, if you're getting things done and things are moving forward, just stay the course. There's no reason to, to hire us because, you know, you, if, if, you've got an, if you've got Indian players that are actually producing, it's from what I've seen, it's a rarity. So you should stick with them. And uh, right. It's all about, you know, getting those first couple key people that really understand, you know, what you're doing and, and you communicate well with, and they can, and that they can drive the people there to do the work and answer all the questions. Yeah. And if you don't have that chemistry and, and those right people in place, you'll fail. Yeah. You know, I think so- that's what I normally end up speaking to people that obviously that have failed most of the time. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's some good points. Speaking of that, so that, that, that sort of lets me transition to one of the big questions I had for you. So as someone, um, as someone who's led 70 developers, 60, 70, whatever, whatever the case may be, have you ever come up to a scenario where you're looking at your, your deadline. So management obviously has a deadline in mind for you and you're looking at, and you, you have budget. Let's say that where you are, you have budget. Um, and you're looking down the horizon at your deadline and you're saying, you know what, this, this is not going to happen and you need to staff up. Right. Yeah. I'd like to know, and, and I think it's very valuable for our, for our listeners because we have a lot of uh, developers that are, that are subscribers to our podcasts and C level executives, CTOs, um, so from someone who's done it, um, what is your process when you need to staff up? Let's say in, in my example, you're saying, you know what, I, I need to add five more developers. I need to add a sysadmin. I need to add, you know, that, that type of addition to your team. What's your process for finding these people? How do you go about well, it? Well, first off, the, the first, you know, question is, is can you add anybody? You know, there, there's a there, good point. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, depending on the length of the project, 
you know, and what your time horizon is, adding people, you know, could be more harmful than not adding people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's let's say if the if the the project you're like I used to, you know, when I was working at the last company or my medical device, you know, we were developing these products over a two, maybe three year period. Okay. Right? Long time horizons. And so if you need to add people, you, you figure out how many you're going to need and you staff up and you, know, you do direct hires or whatever you need to do to get up to that, you know, magic number. Um, and the magic number, you know, you know, you grow that. Now, let's say you're into that three-year project and a year into it, you realize I'm, I, I'm not making the progress I need. I need to add more people. You know, the choices are you can still do direct hires, but you might, you know, hit your head count cap. You know, the company doesn't want, you know, 500 engineers. For whatever reason, yeah. Well, I got the budget. They don't want the head count cap. You know, they want, they want the head count. So then your choices are hire contractors. Now you can do one-off individual contractors, which mm-hmm. might work. You go to a contract agency, you know, give me bodies. Or you can um, job shop out chunks of technology out to a consulting company and let them do the work. Um, okay. So I would use a combination of, you know, those, those methods. I would sit there and say, okay, do I, like, for example, uh, on um, my, one of my last medical products, we had an electronic keyboard, a keyboard on the screen. Well, it's a lot of work to do a French, German, Croatian, Russian, Chinese, you know, Japanese keyboard, just laying it all out, do all the graphics for that and then get all the correct you know, fonts and everything, it was an enormous effort. But the nice thing about it, I could put that into a box and put a bow around it and say, okay, contractor, you do just this. Okay. And, and, and I think my risk was, is that, well, I might not get all the keyboards, but I probably have all the ones I need to start with and I can get the rest of them later, but I'm not distracting my core engineers with something that is more like digging a ditch than it is, you know, putting a man on the moon, you know, and so I would give that work. So I would look for opportunities to box stuff up that I could give to a contracting company to try to take major chunks of work off of my plate to allow me to still make my deadline. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that makes complete sense. Very, very smart. So you're not, you're not disturbing your core team. And if you happen to be in that great position where you can actually get that box with the bow on it, which is not always the case, Right. But that's, yeah, that's fantastic. That's so you, good. So you start to look at where, you know, and, it, and if you do things like in a sort of an agile way too, is the stuff at the end of the project is stuff that could be thrown off. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. make a train. It gets, you know, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have to, you know, I always manage my projects where I have the, I work towards the minimum viable product. Yeah. You know, and, and anything beyond that is gravy. So I always try to make sure that whatever I do, I finish the minimum viable product in plenty mm-hmm. of time and then I just adding features and that's just extras, but therefore I guarantee I make my deadline. Okay. Uh, nice. So now just to, to stay on uh, my line here, I just, so if, if you are, let, so let's go through, if you are looking to add someone as a full-time employee, I assume you would go through a recruiting company at, you know, at that level, you would go through a recruiting company. Would you put, would you post as Cause again, I know it's a little bit of a uh, micro question, but still it's something that I think. Well, it's, so at my, at the, uh, well, almost any company now has full-time recruiters, you know, okay. so my, but at Welch Allen, they had a whole group, you know, like, you know, five, six people. And that's all they did. And they got really good at it. You know, then they, they know if Marshall says he needs a Windows software engineer, C sharp, I give them the job description and they would ask them the appropriate questions to filter them out. So I didn't waste a lot of time talking to people that weren't good. Nice. And they would find people. Um, now, but you know, and you find people that you get at your project. But now if, if you're building a team though, you, you need to think, you know, you need to think long term. You know, I was a big proponent of hiring co-ops and students out of college um, to basically pr- create a funnel of resources. So we would work with local universities in upstate New York, and and where they would send us students that are looking for co-op opportunities, and we would then hire them as during the summer. But then they would be our new young engineers when they graduated. 
So I always try to right. fill a pipeline of having people come in because in this day and age, you know, if, if let's say you have 50 engineers, a good percentage of them are going to quit on you, mm-hmm. you know, within the next year. So you almost constantly have to be recruiting these days. Yeah. I think that's, that's the advantage of using a firm. Um, so now to transition to that. So what if, um, yeah, the student thing is interesting. We, we over here at, at, at our company at Simply PHP, we don't, we don't hire students obviously because we have, you know, we charge clients, so it's difficult to have a student charging. And, and we, I also find that it takes away from our more senior engineers that have yeah. to spend time with the students, showing them how to, how to do their job. Yeah, it's a different school of thought. I mean, I, I'm a big, big proponent of using students. And uh, at Motorola, we were, they, it was really great, Motorola. I, actually, I would recruit juniors and seniors, um, mainly juniors. And at Motorola, I could offer to pay for their last year of school if they would give me three years of employment afterwards. Oh, yeah. That sounds like the military. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And, you know, but, but let me I, when I went to Georgia Tech and I would go there to interview people, I would have 30 people in line. They all wanted to work for me. Oh, of course. Of because, course. you know, because they wanted to get that free year of college. Yeah, nice. Wow. Which, for four years of working, it seemed like a, like a, a great deal. My yeah, the salary is good, sure. Yeah. That's great. So, so now let's go to the scenario where you need to staff up and you want to use uh, a company. So a company in the U.S., company in Canada, North America. What is your process of finding the right company? Do you have like you know track companies that have worked with you in the past? Do you Google? Uh, how does it work? Well, you know? I you know I I was very fortunate at my uh, at it, again, at my at the medical company I worked for, I was very fortunate they had a sourcing a group that there they had a guy there that was really good at f- identifying all the different contracting companies, you know. And you would f- find these people, and we would bring them in and have them do little dog and pony shows, um, uh, and you know, to evaluate if they've done projects similar to what we were working on, and and so on. And so I think over. Over the first couple of years I worked there, we must, I might probably interviewed 15, 20 companies. And eventually I got down to, I was working with three or four and each okay. one of them uh, had different um, specialties. And then I worked with people like uh, I, I, we had a, a product that was uh, going to be our first uh, Linux based um, patient monitor. And at that time, we've been doing everything with ThreadX and, and embedded operating systems and, you know, stuff like that. And we were wanting to go to open source. And I called the, I actually called to talk to TI, I think, um, um, Texas Instruments, and I, where we're going to buy, buy the microprocessor from. And I said, who, which contracting companies have you been working with on this processor? And they said, well, we've been working with this company in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I ever worked with them. I hired them and they helped us develop all the low level operating systems, plugins and connections to our hardware. Okay. Uh, they did great, but they, but when I interviewed them, they had lots of projects that were similar. So I yes. could see results. And now, and every project I did with that outside company, I had very short timing horizons, you know, like two months max, maybe three months where they had to have a deliverable. And if things weren't to being delivered, then I cut them loose and move on. Okay. Okay. You know, I, I think a lot of times people get hooked into these into a contracting company and they can't get out. They 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 yeah. They're they're they you get, especially when you're starting with them, you need to do some test projects, small projects, and see how they perform and see if you like how they manage the project. Do they give you project management plans? Do you do you, do you see the assets? Do you look at the source code? Does the source code is it commented? You know, is the quality of the work good? Did they miss any requirements that you re- gave them? You mm-hmm. know, and but do it in a small project before you give them a twenty million dollar project. Oh, of course, yeah, of course. Ah, that's good. That's a that's a good process. That's a very good process to have. Uh, we deal with a lot of clients that that kind of do that process, and um, yeah, I like I like the fact that you have options too, right? So you're not you're not tied into one company. 
and of course that's you have the budget also to to kind of manage it that way um so that's interesting yeah but fortunate you know working in the medical device industry you know um budgets were never really a problem we always had plenty of money yeah to, yeah <laughs> uh, to work with whereas you know i've been working with startups you know in the last few years and they never have any money <laughs> so that's you know what that's a great transition because i wanted to I wanted to talk about uh, your current passion. So we've talked a lot about uh, your career over the past decades. So let's let's talk about uh, your current passions. And I, I know you like I know you like to to mentor. I know that you like to work a lot with startups, uh, mentoring, which makes complete sense because you were doing startups when you were in college, right? So you weren't even graduated college. So if anyone and these advice on startups, you're definitely the, the person to speak to. So t- tell me a little, about, a little bit about what you're doing with startups. And I have a couple of questions um, that I think could be relevant. Yeah, so um, when I, um, Walt Allen got bought, my last major employer, uh, the medical device company, got bought out by a much bigger company. And they came in and basically all the top execs, you know, uh, were, got, were given a package. And my wife was from Mansfield, Ohio, which is outside of Columbus, Ohio. And she wanted to be back to be closer to family. My two daughters were in college in Ohio. We have no family in New York. So we, we moved from New York to Columbus, Ohio. And for me, I, worked, I came here and I did, not, I did not know a solitary soul, nobody. And I, so I said, I, I decided I wanted to get involved in the high tech. So I, I found meetup.com where you can. What year was this? Sorry, Marshall. 2015. 2015. Okay. Yeah. And so I got on a, a line, looked for meetups, uh, meetup.com website. And I found the JavaScript user group and, you know, and some of the technology user groups. And I, so I went to some of those meetings and then I would, I use that to kind of talk to people and find out about what's going on. And I found out about these, um, uh, incubators here in Columbus that support uh, startups. And so I started, I, I found out about events they were holding and I went to a couple of their events and started running into startups. And then, uh, you know, after a while I started to get to know people. And then I, I ran into a guy one day and he says, you know, I got a friend of mine who's trying to do a startup, you know, would you be willing to talk to him? And mm-hmm. cause he's trying to figure out, you know, how to get the software for this device he wants done. So I met with him and, and he had this cool, you know, device that, to do, that he wanted to build electronics, but he had no idea how to do this. What are all the things he'd have to put together to make it happen? And, and I explained to him exactly what the process is. Okay. Well, you got, you know, you got to make a circuit board. You got to hire somebody to write the firmware. You're going to have to write some software in the cloud for this thing to talk to. I basically was able to sketch out the whole system diagram for how this thing worked. And that was great. That was great, helpful to him. And then he used that to figure out, okay, what do I do first? So I basically gave him a little project plan, but I could do that in a few hours. And, but this guy could never do that. No. You know, and, and so I basically sketched those out and then I did this a couple more times and then I got involved with. Just to clarify, Marshall. So you were doing this just as an open mentorship. Oh, of free. Scenario. You're just helping people out. Okay. I was just helping people out. I was just oh, trying to get back. Because awesome. I, you know, I, I, I always used to joke says, okay, I'll help somebody. And eventually one of those people will hire me. <laughs> that's, that's the way I'm thinking. It's like, hey, that is true. Yeah. You know, I said, Hey, if you, if you help enough people, eventually somebody will hire you, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but it's so fun to help people, isn't it? Especially when they, when they listen and when, when they can learn and you know, that's right. awesome. Right. And so there's, so there's a, there's several uh, places here in Columbus where there's lots of companies that are trying to start up and, and then they have this infrastructure to support them. So I got involved with, uh, with one of them and, and they, they assign, they have entrepreneurs that are coming up and that need help. And it's based on, it depends on what they need help in, then they will um, assign me to, to work with them. So like if they're, nice. so if it's a technology product, maybe it's got some electronics, some software in it, then, then I get assigned to it to help them figure out how to build that. Um, and I also get, I, we do these, uh, they have these events where we uh, run the entrepreneurs through a process to determine that their idea is valid. 
And, um, and so I'm there to, from the technology point of view, say, hey, they got a great idea, but can you technically do it? Oh, can you technically do it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the, people have the idea, but they have no idea they can technically do it. I mean, yeah. can I make a car drive across the United States without anybody ever interacting with it? <laughs> well, sort of. I mean, I mean, my car does it a little bit, but there are all these situations where it doesn't quite work. So it's not 100% right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, but what is it? What would you? What would that be? The technology you'd have to create to make that happen, and and is and what is the current state of the technology to do that? Okay, okay, nice. You know, so, like, like for example, I was working with one company, and they had this. They had these sensors to detecting the angle of an object. Well, right now the the um, the accuracy is a tenth of a degree, which sounds pretty good but they need a thousandth of a degree to make this solution work. And the sensors okay. don't exist yet, you know? And so, I mean, so his idea, it's a good idea, but he needs to wait a few more years and watch this, that sensor market. And when that pro when they get down to a thousandth of the degree or whatever, then he will have a product. Nice. That's a, so that's a good point because there's also, uh, that's the technical side of it. There's also the monetization part, right? So I, I run in personally, I run into a lot of startups that call me up with ideas and they want, you know, estimates on what it's going to take to build it, uh, you know, with PHP. And a lot of times they're not even sure how they're going to monetize it. So do you also, do you also advise on that part as well, since you obviously yeah, have a background? I do, um, and, but it's usually, you know, on the, you know, the technical side of that, you know, so, okay. but, I, but I will talk to entrepreneurs all the time about, you know, the, what's the total addressable market that they can go after. Okay. You know, I, I tell, I tell entrepreneurs all the time, you, should, you, you know, start watching Shark Tank because you sort of get a feel for what's important. You know, like they always want to know if you got patents on your idea. They yeah. always want to know if there's any competitors. They want to know what the total costs of building it is and what the margin is going to be. And they want to know how many people, you know, could possibly want this gadget, this widget. Okay. If you don't know those answers, then you, you need to do some homework uh, because you might not have a viable product. And the number one reason startups fail is because they create a product that nobody wants. Mm. It's the number one reason. Yeah, really? Okay, yeah, so they create now, a now your friends and family will tell you it's the best thing since sliced bread, but yeah, but is you, you you need to really get some people to be honest with you, and you need to really find out. Um, one friend of mine told me that he tells the entrepreneurs you have to ask a hundred people if if they would buy this product or not, and mm -hmm. if you don't ask a hundred people, um, then you know you haven't done your work yet to determine if it's a viable or not. That's true. It's a good point. So a lot of people will build something that they think is incredible. They think is awesome. They think that everyone would want, but they never really solicit the market and, and, and other than their friends and family. Right. To find yeah. out if people are actually wanting it. Right. Now, if you build something for yourself, you know, for your own value, and then you want to, and then you think there might be other people who want it, that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, that's different. That's yeah, you build something that you absolutely need. And you kind of build it in a sense that, okay, I'm building this that if I need it, but I will also leave the, the back door open for like a subscription based option or something like that in case. Yeah, there's all you know, there's, I've, you know, I've run a lot of people that have great ideas, you know, and they build it for themselves. And then they say, Oh, you know, I can maybe monetize this. You know, mm -hmm, yeah. I, I like that sort of back into it that they that they got a product. So uh, just to um, sort of end on, I would like to know um, what's the number one advice you would give to startups? And I guess you kind of already gave it, right? But can you run through those, those, those four or five points? Like if I'm a startup, I come to you with whatever it is, a technical uh, device, some software, a website. What is, if I'm a soft, if I'm a startup, and I come to see you, what is the, what is the top advice that you can give? Well, I, the first thing I was going to, you know, is, uh, you know, how big is the market really? You okay. know, how many people are going to really want this thing? Okay. So now, you know, cause, cause you could spend a lot of time and energy building something, but if there's only five people going to buy it, you know, it's really not worth it. I always, I, I, it's sort of like, 
Um, if I'm going to buy a lottery ticket, I don't buy a lottery ticket until it's more than 50 million. You know, because I think myself, <laughs> anything less than that, it's just going to irritate my life. <laughs> if it's over 50 million, yeah. that, that, that kind of money will solve all those problems. But if you, have, if you win like 10 million, it's just going to irritate you. you know? <laughs> it's not going to, you know. Eventually, so probably, you know, yes. Are you going to have enough customers to make mm. it worthwhile? The second thing is, is that um, can you protect it? You know, okay, can way, you protect it? Yeah. And or is it, and, and is it unique? You know, okay. there's nothing worse than being the third guy to develop a watch. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're Apple, you can do that. You can be the, the third guy into a market because they're going to have it, enough money to stick with it and keep improving it until they're number one. Yeah. But most, most entrepreneurs, startups, they only get one shot. You mm -hmm. ask that start, you ask that venture capitalist for money and you're only going to get to ask him once for that idea. You're not going to get a second shot at it, you know, most of the time. True. So you got to make sure you have a, a good market. You got to make sure you're unique. You got to make sure you, um, you can protect it so, with some sort of patents because, you know, you hear Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank all the time. He says, what's going to stop me from, um, you know, hiring some smart guys and building the same thing and selling it, you know, to Walmart before you get around to it. Yeah. And, and that, and in this day and age, um, with the power of the internet and, and, and stuff like that, almost any idea you have, someone's going to see about it soon and try to copy it. Yeah. You know, so Great point. If you can't protect it, you know, you'll, depending on how fast you can move, you won't be able to move fast enough to keep them at bay. Mm -hmm. And as part of your um, mentoring startups, um, guiding people, like how do they patent something? Because patent is a tricky game. I know people that that will cost them a thousand dollars to patent something and someone else will cost them thirty thousand dollars to patent something. Because if you come up to the wrong person, because there's a lot of people out there that, you know, that are the wrong people to go see. So is that part of your mentorship? Well, not, I, I don't recommend particular patent attorneys, but there are, you know, these organizations that are, like, that are here in Columbus and there, there are entrepreneurship communities in almost every major city in the world, you know, so, so it doesn't matter if you're Chicago or New York or Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, Toronto, there's, there's probably some entrepreneurial group there where you can get support for that, the provide support for startups. And a lot of times like here in Columbus, there are attorneys that specialize in helping startups and they usually do it for free to give you all the initial advice. Like, is this something that's patentable or not? Oh yeah. That's super important. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, why go hire a patent attorney and spend a thousand bucks when you can ask this guy for free and he'll give you an opinion if you're, you know, on what you should do. And, you know, when you start patenting something, it's a slippery slope because, you know, do you patent just in the U S or do you patent around the world? You know, it becomes a very expensive proposition. And so you, you really got to think about, um, is that the only way you're going to protect your product? You know, I, I like products that that the intellectual property I'm putting into them is such that it keeps them from getting copied. Okay. So like, you know, like Coca-Cola, you know, if you don't know the formula how to make Coca-Cola, you can't copy it. Yeah. You know, and, and I like products where there is a little bit of that in it because uh, that keeps people from casually, you know, just copying your idea. Nice. Good point. So how does someone who's listening now get a hold of you i think you you alluded to there's so there's a there's a startup organization uh in ohio that you belong to can you give yeah, us those, the details and right if you're if you're in the columbus ohio area or central ohio um there's a group here called red one ventures and it's a basically a startup you know incubator and they have about 50 or so uh startups under roof they actually have a facility oh, nice. where they will give you a little space, you know, depending on uh, what, you, you know, where you are in the process and they give you a place to work. They'll give you support, you know, to get your startup off the ground. They also have the, uh, a bunch of different uh, programs where you can take an idea and run it through a process to help you evaluate if it's a good idea or not. And you should put oh, it or not. Nice. And then they even will uh, help 
uh, connect you with uh, venture capital um, folks that have money to to invest in startups. And some, you know, investors, there's also, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm an expert on the investing side, but there are investors that like to get in at lots of different levels. Mm. Some will want to get pre-revenue. Some will only get there when you have a million in revenue. Some only $5 million of revenue and they will jump in um, at that point. Uh, there also, I want to make sure your, re- your listeners know there's lots of free money out there. Lots of free money. There's grants. You know, if you have something um, that you're working on it that relates to some social good, you can get money from the state, the federal grants. Um, so be looking out for those because you can get, you know, $200,000 to work on an idea and you never have to pay it back. Wow, fantastic! And and there's a lot of these grants that are out there. There's um, depend on what you're working. On. Another thing is to get involved with the local universities in your area. So, like for us in Columbus, reason this area is really strong with this kind of stuff is because we have Ohio State, which is you know one of the largest universities in the country, and they have lots of outreach programs to support entrepreneurships. They also encourage all their professors to try to take their ideas and commercialize them to the extent they actually have a Ohio State commercialization office where they actually uh, take an idea and then look for companies to commercialize the idea. Oh, so, nice. so a professor has an idea about some medical device and the commercialization office shows it to a bunch of different companies say, would you like to license this idea from Ohio State and run with it? Oh, very nice. Yeah, so that's even if you don't have an idea, you can go to these universities and, and go through their catalog of ideas and pick one and try to, and, and, and say, I would like to take on selling or commercializing this, this idea. Fantastic, that's a great initiative. Yeah, so there are lots of uh, entrepreneurship groups you know, in most cities. Um, and like in Columbus, there's a, we have two large cities, there are suburbs, one innovating uh, in New Albany and uh, Dublin, and each one of them have their own entrepreneurial centers. And these are buildings with lots of little offices that are low cost, and they they um, they make them available to entrepreneurs or startups to get going, with the hopes that eventually they'll get big and then open up a real office in their town. So oh, yeah, of course, resources or low cost resources that you can get access to if you look. That's fantastic. Marshall, I really want to thank you for, for spending time with us. And um, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to put your, I'm going to find a way to put your LinkedIn uh, because honestly, if I had a startup or someone wants to talk to me about startups, I would love to, to talk to you because you know what, you, you seem like a very open and uh, you would be a great startup mentor. So I hope that, um, can someone reach out to you that's outside of Ohio just to, yeah, sure. I talk to people um, all the time, you know, differently. Yeah. Cause I, you know, cause I, um, I have helped other startups in, in other places. And so, uh, um, you know, so people can reach out to me. Uh, that's really yeah, nice. It's, it's got my contact info. Yeah. It's great when someone who's uh, done what you've done is, is ready to, to, to mentor. That's like, uh, that's super important, I think. Uh, and, and I, and uh, hats off to you and congratulations on everything. So you're, you're sort of, other than the mentoring startups, uh, I guess you're retired, semi-retired? Yeah. Yeah. I basically, I, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to, I was retired or sort of not working and then I took a job and, and that w- I did that for a while and I really learned something that I don't want to work for anybody else ever again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I got it out of my system and, uh, and I like, I don't really need to work. And so, um, nice. financially I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, I got some good advice when I was younger, uh, put money away every month and, uh, it's helped me be ready for retirement. And so, but I really like technology. So I love talking to technology related people and keeping my you know toe in what's going on and learning new stuff. And so that's, that, so helping the startups helps me keep connected to what's going on in the technology fields. And, oh, true. That's you know, so I, I always learn about stuff I didn't know about and that is, that, that makes it worthwhile for me. Do you have any passions outside of technology? Like, Oh, you know, golf, camping. Well, I, well, I, my, my three hot, well, my 
I do woodworking is one of my hobbies. Um, electronics. I like to make my own circuit boards. I have a 3D printer. I like to design things with my 3D printer. Um, oh, cool. Um, and then I and then I um, I volunteer in a couple of different groups. I, I help uh, a couple of job search groups here locally by volunteering, helping people find jobs, and uh, the oh, whole nice. process of you know looking for jobs and networking and and uh, helping people connect. Because there's a lot of great people out there that are looking for jobs. They just don't. They just need to meet that right person that can help them get that job. Yeah, that's what it's all about, right? Just finding yeah. the, the right. Yeah, so person. I try to do a lot of, you know, facilitation of uh, networking for job search. Oh, that's fantastic, Marshall. You're an awesome guy. Well, thank, thank you so much for spending time with me. I really, really appreciate it. No problem.